And you're very welcome along to another RTE Rugby podcast. Neil Tracy here with you. And delighted to be joined by Bernard Jackman, as usual. Birch, how are you today? Great, thank you. And Mick Carney as well, who hasn't been with us for a while. Mick, former Leinster, Connacht, Ulster, and now Clontarf, second row. Mick, last time you were with us, things have changed a lot in the in the AIL table since. Clontarf on a bit of a roll now. Yeah, big time. Thankfully, we've managed to put a few good results back to back. Um, hopefully, we can keep it going now. What is it this weekend? Shannon away? Shannon away. Yeah, the old enemy. So, should be a good one, hopefully. And you're playing a lot of back row see, these days as well, yeah? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know what's happened there. Um, I was told that the older you got, the further the further forward you yeah, got. Your jersey Thankfully. number shrinks, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm doing the opposite. Mick, what do you what do lads feel about the clashes with international rugby? Obviously, this weekend is the follow weekend, but last weekend, clash with the Six Nations, lads just happy to to get the games played, or would you prefer to have down weeks those weekends? Yeah, it's it's a good question. Um, I don't know if lads be too keen on down weeks just because the way the AIL is structured at the minute, um, there actually is quite a bit of free time in between the blocks, but like. I, I don't see why those games couldn't be moved to Friday nights. Yeah. Um I think there's almost like a I I, I wouldn't know how to put it, but I think Plantar have proposed Friday night to the team we played last week and they they almost feel like they're trying they're being caught out. Yeah. That makes sense. You know, the sense of all oh, what why do they want to move the game to here? Um and yeah, like for, for us I think it'd be better if if the RFU or the the, the controlling board at the time just said, okay, it's an international on on Saturday. This game is being moved Friday night for everyone's benefit. Yeah, and particularly particularly when it's, you know, geographically makes sense. Like as I said, you were playing Trinity at the weekend, just gone. It was even down in Limerick, you'd Gary Owen and Shannon and they're kicking off at pretty much the same time as an Ireland Six Nations game. It just doesn't really make any sense when there are, you know, four or five other other slots across the weekend where you could you could easily have those games. Now I know it's a different story obviously when you're you know you might have a a team from Dublin or a team from Limerick or Cork traveling up the north or you know a team from a team from Belfast traveling back down but when you're talking about teams in the same city I mean there's no reason why those games should be played at the same time as an Ireland match. Big time. Yep. Yeah, completely agree. On the on the Ireland game we'll dive straight into it. So 34-20 win against Italy. Three wins out of three. Grand Slam still rolling on. Three bonus point wins out of three. And Birch, I put it to you that in games in the past against Italy, we've come away from them where Ireland have won by 40, 50 points. I know in 2019 it was a different story. It was a, you know, that was a, a tough old day at the office. But there have been a lot of games against Italy down the years where we've come away wondering what have we really learned from the outing? What have, you know, Andy Farrell or Joe Schmidt, what have they actually gained from it? But I think it's it's pretty obvious now in the last couple of days that there have been plenty of important things to to take away from the game on Saturday against Rome, and that can only be a good thing. Yeah, absolutely. And I think look, it's, it's I was probably one of the people I, I was one of the people who was saying a year ago, well, what are they bringing to the competition and and questioning their value and and to be fair to them, you know, beating Wales, beating. Australia in November and the way they've played against France, England and Ireland um, and the future growth that you would think is in that team, you know, a lot of really good young players um, and, and more, more importantly, the spirit they seem to have, they never seem to give up, which is um, probably different than, than some of the, 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 the teams in the past. Um, they are worth their place in the competition. And from an Irish point of view, you know, that was a hard earned victory and uh, we had to fight um, we had to manage the game at key moments and and we got the maximum out of it which is great from, from an Irish point of view but I mean if you're Wales now uh, you know you, you're very worried about playing Italy whereas in the past that, that was a soft game so I think that's great um, and their 20s in fairness played a lot of, they lost in the end but they were good on Friday night um, and yeah all you just need to do now is get I suppose I think realistically it's always going to be hard for Italy with one only one competitive feeder team. I know they have guys playing a, a few guys playing abroad, you know, Garbisi, etc. But um realistically now I think it's getting Zebra up to the level where they're mid table in the in the URC and having having two teams to, to pick from like 
you know, the Scots do with Glasgow and Edinburgh. Um, that's probably the next step for them. But it was a good, a really good challenge for Ireland. I thought Farrell would have learned a lot from it and, and um, it'll actually stand to us. Yeah, and Mick, just before we we started recording, you were talking about, obviously, you, you spent a bit of time playing over in Italy and I know you didn't work under him, but you'd, you said you'd heard a lot of stories about the, the, the way Kieran Crowley went about his business and you were kind of very, very impressed by it. No, definitely. There was a couple of uh, Treviso guys who'd moved to Zebra the same season that I was there. And, you know, they just mentioned when when he first arrived, they were almost asking each other when they were going to start doing rugby stuff. You know, um, he was so keen to get out into the community to kind of connect the fans with the team. Um, and, you know, I think by doing that, he puts pressure on the players when they're on the field to go, okay, well, you know, I want to go out and play well for these people. You know, I'm, I'm representing, you know, the, the baker down the road, I'm representing the butcher around the corner. Um, and you know, the, the season that they, that they went really well in might've been the, the pro 12 or it could have been the pro 14 at the time. They, they lost to Munster um, in, in that semi-final. Um, you know, that, that was, that was a big, that was a big talking point for them throughout the season. Um, and he's obviously carried that through to Italy because as, as Bert said, um, the fighting spirit that, that they've shown in the first three games, even the last ditch tackle that was made um, at the end of the game, the last day on, on James Lowe, I think it gives, it gives a real indication as to, uh, I suppose, th- their want to go for, for the full game, which, which maybe hasn't been there in previous times. Yeah, and that's a good point, actually, even just that that last tackle right at the very, very end when Ireland were pushing to try get get one final try. Like, you know, the game was done at that stage. It was a it was a 14 point match. There was no hope that Italy could turn over the ball and, you know, somehow go on and win a game. Clock was in the red. And I think there were probably three or four stages during that game where you could probably pinpoint moments where the Italy of old probably would have rolled over and Ireland would have turned a a 10 or a, or a 20 point lead into a 30 or 40 point lead, but they just kept coming back at Ireland. And it, you know, it just, it, it shows a very, very positive attitude with the way they're playing at the moment. Yeah, absolutely. As, as Birch mentioned as well, I think, I think the more players, there's no disrespect to the Italian system because Treviso are going very well and, and Zebra are, are getting better game on game. Um, but the more players that Italy can kind of have playing outside of Italy and, and bringing that information back um, into, into the national team, the better it'll be for them going forward. Um, obviously, like Scarbisi coming back, Fischetti coming back from, from London Irish as well. Um, I'd, imagine, I'd imagine those guys have had, have had a really positive impact on the camp. You're nodding your head along there, there Birch. Is, is it tricky, though, to, to get that balance between getting the right number of players out and bringing back those kind of lessons and and not ultimately ultimately ending up in a situation where all of your best players are essentially playing outside of the country and you know you lose the competitiveness that maybe Benetton have, have started to pick up pick up on in the last couple of years. Yeah, look I I think it is um it's a it's a fine balance that needs to be managed. But I, I totally agree with Mick. I think having, you know, players come back in, especially when you only have two teams and, and the Scots have have done that, you know what I mean? Um, with with certain amount of players playing outside of, outside of the Glasgow and, and Edinburgh franchises, and um, I think it does give a boost of confidence. Um, different way of doing things, you know, different coaching outlook, um, and different understanding of of other opposition team strengths and weaknesses, particularly for it in, in for the Italians because. Um, it's difficult for them in the URC. I know Benetton are doing okay, and and Zebra are showing um slight improvement, but they aren't winning, you know, week in week out like say the Irish provinces are, uh, and that can maybe cause a little bit of self belief. So even someone coming back in like Facetti in in London Irish and saying, look, at, you know, this is how we're training is is right, you know, where we need to be. This is what the, the top English teams are doing, etc. Can just give reassurance. Um, so I think it is a really good thing. I don't think they'll lose them all, and this sounds bad, but I don't think all those players, you know, would be sought after by the other clubs at the moment. You know, um, it takes a while and, and the foreign player um, quotas across France and the UK are getting tighter to get into. So um, it, it always will only be a small handful, but I think that small handful can can help. And that's probably what, what going to Wales. <clears throat> Wales losing the 60 cap rule now. Um, we'll see more of their players playing outside of Wales. And the problem for from a Welsh point of view is 
you know, uh, that's going to go from being, you know, uh, a trickle of players that they could control to potentially, you know, uh, a, a river out of control. And, and they may be the other side of things where, you know, they suddenly have 15 or 16 of their squad playing outside of Wales. So um, it is hard to get right. But from a Welsh point of view, when you see the salaries they're, gonna, they're offering to the regional players, it's it's a no-brainer. And also, I suppose, geographically, you know, a lot of those players can, can drive across the bridge and um, even still stay in Wales. I know, I know some of the lads who played for Bristol and Bath never left Wales. So um, it's not a big thing to uproot their families, etc. So it's, it's a fine it's a fine line. But we're, we're the opposite, obviously. We've, we've kept everyone in Ireland. But I think having four teams, you can potentially do that because there is, you know, different ideas coming. Uh, but when you only have two franchises like the Scots and the Italians do, I think it's no harm. On on Ireland's performance still on the weekend, Birch, we said we we learned plenty about it. Is is one of the most important things we learned about it the the importance of of Gary Ringrose in the team? Yeah, look, we Gary Ringrose has been exceptional for Ireland, and it's not like an unsung hero because we've been saying every been week talking about him now for months and months and months. Yeah, yeah, he's been top class, but probably. That's because we've been singing his praise because of the individual moments he was having himself. But I think what we saw on Saturday was how he helps people inside and outside him look a little bit better as well, just through his um his confidence, his um communication, his um his ability to make you know good reads, good defensive decisions, um, has made that channel for us, that 13 and outside 13 channel you know, not look like a weakness. Um, whereas obviously Italy made a huge amount of, of ground in and around that space. Um, and it wasn't just Bundy Aki missing tackles that Gary Ringrose would have made. It was how James Lowe and, and Mac Hansen had to try and adapt um, or made reads, you know, that exposed them. Um, so and I think it was hard on Bundy because Bundy hasn't played for a while. Um, uh, he's not, the quickest, um, he's not the quickest 13 uh, around. And he played against a team who, like if he played against Wales, I don't think there would have been any issue, to be honest, because Wales at the moment aren't set up to attack like the Italians were. So, um, uh, yeah, there's a lot of different things went wrong um, and went against us. But you know, we managed to win the game, which is which is the um, most important thing. Yeah, and these are the things, Mick, as well, like as, as Bert was saying, Ireland managed to win the game and you know I think in the in the past I don't think Ireland would have been picking apart wins like this against Italy as negatively as maybe we probably are but it's the it's probably the standard they've set themselves over the the last 18 to 21 months that even a relatively decent victory we can still be picking apart little things and you know trying to trying to make it trying to make it perfect for the next time around Absolutely, as you mentioned, that's that's the standard that Ireland are at now. Um, I think on on your point on the importance of Gary Ringrose, I think this has also really highlighted the importance of Robbie Henshaw. Um, we know he's he's an incredibly important player for Ireland anyway, but like Bundy hasn't played a huge amount of thirteen. Like that third test against the All Blacks, Robbie actually pushed out to thirteen from twelve, and Bundy and Bundy went went into twelve. You know, um, so. It's brilliant for the depth of Ireland. It's brilliant for, you know, trying guys in positions where they're maybe not as comfortable. But as as Birch mentioned, the way Italy were set up um, to attack, it, w- it was always going to be a tough day at the office in the 13 channel. You know, Brex, uh, Ignacio Brex has arguably been one of Italy's standout players for the competition. Um, I think looking at the game as a whole, like if he hadn't dropped it onto the toe, into the first, in the first half there and he'd just gone straight hands like there's a good chance the result potentially could have been could have been different I know that's complete speculation for me but um, looking at the momentum of the game uh, the game the game could have gone very differently if, if Brex had just gone straight hands there yeah and Andy no Andy Farrell said exactly that in his post-match press conference that he was you know his heart was in his mouth briefly while that ball was floating in the air after, after Brex kicked it but on on the centres and on Aki as well, Birch, I'll probably I'll, I'll make it fair on him as well because we've spoken about obviously the, the missed tackles and he's probably getting a lot of the heat for the, the defensive mishaps Ireland had. But on the ball, he did a lot of absolutely brilliant things. If you look at the, the first few Irish tries and even the James Lowe try that wasn't where he spilled the ball over the line. I mean, Bundy Aki had his hands 
in every single one of those in every single one of those passages of plays through an offload to to James Lowe for that uh, or sorry not to James Lowe but in the lead up to that score through the offload to James Lowe moments afterwards to put James Ryan away scored a try himself and very nearly had a second one so he had a lot of absolutely brilliant moments on the ball as well and that's the that's the trade off you have yeah no he I don't think he did well considering he hasn't played a lot um and attacking wise look at Bundy's a Bundy's a very good player and look at I think if he played 13 again Next week, he'd be better. You know, it was a big ask of him. But what we know is he gets you go forward. Um, we know that he's um, he's well able to to offload, to fix people. Um, and he's a ball player. And, like, to be honest, McCluskey's done very well to get ahead of him as a 12. Um, and I think that battle is still far from run. You know, I think they're neck and neck. What I agree with, I, I, I agree with Mick, I think Robbie is... is has been missed a little bit at the moment, and Robbie is our next thirteen as well. You know, he's he's if Gary's out and Robbie's fit, I think Robbie plays thirteen, and and it's not an issue. But um, I think we're very lucky now to have those four: Bundy, Robbie, Gary, Stewart, who we've got like uh, absolutely no fear about, no worry about. Then you have Jimmy O'Brien. I probably would like to see Jimmy O'Brien come on a little bit earlier, uh, um, come in at thirteen a little bit earlier. I think that was maybe an opportunity missed, but I can understand the way the game was going. Um, it was different in, against South Africa because it was injury enforced. Um, but I could sense that you know Farrell obviously didn't want to change too much until the game was won. Um, and then we haven't obviously seen Jamie Osborne get that opportunity, but he's he's someone who's week in week out shown that he has the ability as well. So we're well and obviously Hume up north, and uh, we're we're well stocked. We're well stocked at centre. But um, for me, you know, the question mark around who the backup thirteen to Gary is if Gary's injured. I think it's Robbie, and I think Robbie has the more than enough ability to to come in even cold and just deal with those situations that hurt us against Italy a little bit better. And then the the final question on the on the centres, and don't worry, I'll put it to to both of you, but I'll I'll throw it to you first. Birch is for Scotland. There's a fair chance all four of those centres are going to be fit: Gary Ringers, Robbie Henshaw, Bundyaki, Stuart McCluskey. What's your what's your twelve and thirteen? Bearing in mind that obviously straight. Robbie Henshaw doesn't yeah. have the match fitness that others will have, but so you're factoring that in as well. Yeah, I, I go straight back. I, I go straight back to Robbie and Gary. I think this is a massive um, uh, threat for us, Scotland. Uh, I, I was really impressed with Dupalotu and, and Hugh Jones' relationship again. Um, <clears throat> Finn Russell asks a lot of questions of. Of any of any center partnership in terms of how flat he plays, how late he plays to um to the line, and um I know Robbie hasn't played a huge amount uh as, as but I would be comfortable enough that putting him back in there and the relationship he has with Sexton under and Ringrose you know would make up for that lack of game time um and also you know, looking looking towards England I just think if Robbie Henshaw's fit he he starts and whether that's you know I don't think he needs two or three games. To get up to speed, to be honest. Um. Uh. So yeah, I, I would go. I would go to, with the I, the boring answer is I go. I go back to where we were, um. Before Robbie got injured. Mick, how about you? Yeah, I'd I'd probably make make the same call. I think it is a tough decision though, considering how how well uh Stuart McCluskey and Gary Ringhouse have gone together. Um. I think there is a massive amount of cohesion there, but you know, in saying that, see, uh. Johnny, Robbie, and, and Gary played together in, in Leinster uh, week in, week out. As well as that, you know, I think by starting Robbie and starting Gary, if, you know, God forbid Robbie was to pick up a knock early in the game, you can always you can always take take him off and, and bring someone else on. Whereas if you put Robbie on the bench and you bring him on after 50, 55 minutes and he and he picks up a knock, uh, you're you're looking at kind of proper reshuffle stuff then. Um so yeah, in summary, I think I think I would go with with Robbie and Gary as well. Moving a little bit further inside the pitch, then we had a obviously a brand new halfback partnership as well, Craig Casey and Ross Byrne. And I've seen mixed reviews, Birch, to be honest, about how well they played. I've seen plenty of people praising them for for what they did, saying they offered Ireland a lot, or even individually, even as opposed to as a partnership. And I've seen other people who were pretty underwhelmed by it. What was your own your own reading on them? No, I thought it was. I thought it was more than more than decent. Um, difficult team weren't obviously. 
Um, on the front foot, a lot of changes, late changes. It's a typical game, you know. Um, the French game at home was was a was a a game that um we all just think back on as if everything was brilliant because of the quality of it. Uh, but there was moments in that where we were under the pump as well. But the end result was in a home game. Um, and we were all delighted. Uh, and I think it's always more difficult away, um, particularly against a team like Italy, where maybe the perception is it's going to be all all easy, and it wasn't. And I thought Ross, particularly that third quarter, and Craig as well. I I just thought they managed the game very well. Um, and then obviously we, you know, Connor comes on and he has another big impact uh, this time off the. He has another big impact in the game this time off the bench. So he's the great thing is he's bounced back. I mean, he, you know, take back to January, he was dropped from Munster. Um, he's refound his form, which is great. But Craig and Ross, I think they did, um, they did perfectly fine, you know. And um, they weren't never going to do any more. I don't think, given given how well Italy played and how we probably were just a little bit off in terms of our overall performance. Yeah, and for for Ross as well, Mick. For for a player who seems to be criticised a, a decent bit for not really bringing the ball up to the line or staying a little bit too deep. I mean, if you look at, I think it was the, the second and third Irish tries in the opening half, they're, I mean, they're a direct result of him bringing it right up to the point of contact and shifting it on. And he gets he gets a couple of dunts on each occasion for a for good measure as well. But ultimately, it's what, it's what puts Ireland through gaps. No, absolutely. Absolutely. Like, he's obviously working with with Johnny Sexton week in, week out in Leinster and now now in Ireland. And Johnny's the, the best in the world at that. You know, he takes it right to the line. He takes an unbelievable amount of punishment. Um and you know it's it's a work on it's a work on for Ross as well. For, for me, it's great to see Ross get a start against someone that isn't England. Um and kind England of the way as well. <laughs> yeah, England away and 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 show his worth. Um I, I thought both lads went went pretty well the last day, considering the circumstances. Obviously, Italy away, they're they're full of piss and vinegar, um, and they've they've gone pretty well in the last couple of games. Good few changes for Ireland uh, players, maybe playing out of position. Um, so yeah, I I thought the lads had a good outing, and I thought Ross was pretty brave, as you mentioned, in terms of taking it right to the line and and taking a bit of punishment there. And Bursa, when it comes to analysing out-haves in this country, do we need to kind of rein ourselves in and realise that if Johnny Sexton is out, the next man coming in, if he doesn't play as well as peak Johnny Sexton, that, that doesn't necessarily mean he's not up to scratch. I mean, Johnny Sexton is a once-in-a-generation talent. You're not you're not just going to be able to sub that in straight away and get the exact same type of player. Yeah, absolutely. And in time, potentially, if they got a run of games like Johnny did... Um, at the start, and obviously Johnny earned it, but um, we can't expect someone who's just still finding their feet at a test match level. Um, you know, I know some coaches think it takes 20, 20 caps to really be fully comfortable. Um, and obviously for an out half, they need to be starting probably most of those. Um, but I think I think Ross is just ticking along very nicely. Um, and you know he he needs to because you know. He will have noticed Joey Carby being brought back in to travel. Uh, Joey's been playing well for Munster. Uh, Jack Crowley's just you know itching for game time, and, and anytime he gets game time, he shows that he has a a, a very nice set of skills. So it's it's not over for, uh, in terms of that. You know who's going to be successor to the Sexton, but I think Ross Ross is the Ross is probably the man in in control because um probably he's the most proven game manage, ma- manager. Um, goal kicker, and has given you know has shown big moments like obviously against Australia. Um, I thought even against France, you know, he was there to, to close that game out, and that's that's invaluable from a, an Andy Farrell point of view. So, um, I think Ross is in a in a, in a good position, but it's we've got depth all of a sudden. And yeah, that leads me exactly where I was going to go. Final couple of points before we talk about about Scotland, but on the depth. We saw against Wales and France, pretty much to a man, every every replacement has actually come on and made an impact on the game, even if it's just one or two moments. And I know that Andy Farrell probably didn't go to his bench in certain for certain players as early as he did in, in the other games. Uh, but you look at someone like Ryan Baird, who was getting his first chance in the Six Nations, make he came on and made a massive impact and had a, a direct hand in, in the final try and had a direct hand in 
that penalty that Ross Byrne kicked to to push Ireland back out into a seven point lead. Conor Murray comes off the bench again and makes a, a significant impact for, for the final try. It's been a pattern now three games in a row where the players coming off the bench, whether it's their first game in at 12 months in, in Ryan Baird's case for Ireland, or if they're, you know, a seasoned veteran like Conor Murray, that they're coming on and they're making big impacts on games. For sure. And, you know, I think for those guys as well, they're sitting on the bench and they're watching players in their position go really well during the game. You know, it's a sign of, of a really good environment. They're going, if I don't come on here and make a serious impact, you know, I won't be able to have a conversation on Monday or Tuesday around around selection. Um in terms of in terms of big moments from those guys, obviously Murray had a had an excellent impact when he came on. Baird got that huge turnover. But even like, you know, Kilcoyne, mm-hmm. Kilcoyne came on the lead up to Mac Hansen's try like he has a huge clean out in that midfield rook, you know, Seb Negri just has to check himself a small bit coming around. He ends up kind of chasing Murray across then from, from the pillar position. Uh, Lamaro is like, he's completely empty on the far side of the rook. So he, he inevitably like can't catch Mac Hansen going, going through the gap that's been created by Negri kind of over chasing Murray there. Um, so yeah, it's it's those kind of it's those little details and those little impacts from from the bench coming on uh, that you know is is having really massive massive impacts on the game for Ireland and it's it's great to see. Yeah, it really really is. And then just final point, guys on on Ireland specifically before we start bringing Scotland into the picture. But in terms of back row, Caelan Doris, are you starting him at eight? Are you starting him at six? Or does it really matter? Are we over? Are we overblowing this a little bit, Birch? No, he starts at eight. I think it doesn't matter. Um, he's the best eight in in this competition. He, he may be one of the best eight in the world, and I just think it gets him into the game a little bit more. Um, so for me, he starts eight. And is Peter Amani six then? Or are you? Yeah, yeah. No, I think that balance Baird Baird six. Baird is putting big pressure on, but I don't think he's done enough yet to. Um, to take over from from Pete. Um, if he if Pete was injured, I would have no worries about playing him, playing him six. But I think the balance of the back row with Omani, Van der Fleer, and Doris, um, has been proven to be very effective for us in big games. So, um, I wouldn't be making a change there. Make what about yourself now that you can talk to us in depth about the work of being a blindside flanker. <laughs> Yeah, I agree with Bert, sir. I think I think Brian Barrett's the only one who is pushing Pete from a line out ability point of view. Um, you know, P- Peter Romani is essentially a cheat code when it comes when it comes to the line out in terms of his his effectiveness there. Um and in terms of Doris playing eight as well, I I'd, I'd completely agree with that. Like they're they're very separate positions. Um and the more you can get him into the game, uh Obviously, the, the better it's going to be for Ireland. Very good. So on Scotland then, so that game is Sunday 12th of March, live on RT2 and RT player. So on Scotland, Birch, they were beaten 32-21 by France. Scoreline possibly a little bit skewed considering it was a, a try with the final play of the game for Gael Fiku that probably put a bit of a buffer between the sides. But crucially for Scotland, and they knew this going into the game against France as well, that regardless of what was going to happen, they were still going to have a shot, a title shot coming into those final two games against Ireland and against Italy. Do, do you think that that defeat against France is going to dent their confidence too much or will they kind of, will they have targeted these final two games anyway? Yeah, look, obviously it, it, it'd be disappointed uh, with the result, particularly because I think they had a bonus point there for the taken at least. And, and obviously... Um, that sucker punch of a, a last minute try for Fiku took it away from him. But I think I was speaking to some of the assistant coaches afterwards. So, uh, their their spot was quite close to our commentary area, and um, they were really proud and uh, uh, of the way they they found a way back into the game. Obviously, they conceded a couple of very soft tries, well taken by France, but soft tries at the start, red card, and I know it ended up being fourteen v fourteen, but. Um, it did mess them up a little bit, but I think they showed enough to say they are a genuine threat. I wasn't sure about their, I wasn't sure about the form of beating England away on the first day, which obviously is a huge result historically. But England just coming to terms with that 
you know, new style of play with Bortwick, etc. They weren't at their best. Wales obviously isn't, you know, legitimate Six Nations winning form to beat them at the moment. Uh, but at all against France, and I know France aren't perfect at the moment, and France look tired, and um, it's still a massive achievement to stay in the game against them in a in a packed, you know, uh, Stade de France with um, the belief that France have at the moment, uh, and uh, I think that was a really good performance, and like they've got some very good players, and like even someone like Richie Gray is now back, you know, to the level he was at four or five years ago. They've got a bit of depth in the front row coming off the bench. You know, they can make changes that don't weaken them significantly. Um, you know, they're able to bring Dempsey off the bench as a, as a power, uh, powerful ball carrying back row. And then their back line, I mean, the back line is so dangerous. Uh, uh, like Ben White, his service is, is, is phenomenal. If you give Russell time and space, which France did, um, he could pull um, some ridiculous passes. Um you know, off and and obviously he's he's a bit of a liability as well. We saw for Ramos try, but um, they're a genuine threat. They've got a lot of power um and play with a lot of speed. It's very similar to Ireland how they play, um. So yeah, that's going to be a brilliant game. You know, because both teams want to attack, um, and uh, both teams have the skill set to do it. Yeah, and it it links back Mick to what we were talking about with Ireland's defense and the the amount of missed tackles they had and sorting out particularly defensively up the center because we saw at the weekend and we've seen for a few weeks now how devastating the likes of Finn Russell, Sione Tu Pelotu, Hugh Jones, Du and Van der Merwe can be if they're if they're given time and space. No, completely. I think you know it's it's been well documented, but the unpredictability of of Finn Russell is. Massive, you know, um, it's a massive strength to a bow when it comes off positively. Um, and then it's, you know, it's obviously a, it's a bit of a crux when when it doesn't work out for him like it did the last day um, with that intercept pass to Ramos, as, as Birch mentioned. Um, so, like, Ar- Ireland are going to have to be really good to beat them. You know, I know that's a, it's a pretty obvious statement. Um, looking at it historically, like... Scotland haven't beaten Ireland in Murrayfield since 2017. You know, previous to that, I think it was like 2013, maybe, um, because I know Scotland got that win in Pro Park in 2010. So, like, the, I think there will be a bit of confidence to take from that. You want to, you don't want to rest on history too much. Um, but at the same time, uh, I think going over there when Gary gets back into the mix defensively. Ireland will, will have too much from there. Yeah, and I think all of the results so far are just, just kind of week on week. It's underlining how farcical the, the World Cup draw has been where it was taking place in 2020 and we've got the five best teams in the world, according to the rankings at the very least, on the same side of the draw. Three of the top five in, in the same pool. And it's incredible to think that you know, one of Ireland, Scotland, and South Africa on current form aren't going to be at a at a World Cup quarter final. Now, I know I, I actually read earlier on there are plans for the next World yeah. Cup draw to be taking place a little bit later, but it's going to be have to it's going to have to be a lot later to be in any way relevant come tournament. Yeah, look, I think this 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 um our state of events has has made them actually have to readdress it. It gives them obviously great clarity and, and, and comfort making it so early and everyone can get their planning you know right but the reality is when yeah. you see what's happened with it being so lopsided and particularly our group um it's it's nonsense really so it's good to see world rugby actually just say look at yeah we're we're going to address this it's it's not on um and because it's look at it's, it's because there's so there's such a gap between the top eight or nine in the world and, and the rest you know it, it's it's terrible when they end up on the same side. So um, it's not ideal. It makes it more exciting for, for the neutrals. Uh, it makes it more nerve wracking for, for us, the Scots and the South Africans. But um, um, yeah, we're going to have to overcome that. Quickly on, on France, Birch, before we, we move on, they've been pretty underwhelming so far in the Six Nations. Like, are they, do, do you think there's the pressure of a home World Cup year creeping in? Is it a bit of tiredness? Do, do you expect them to kind of be pretty much back to, to top form and top shape by the time a World Cup rolls around? What have you, what have you? Yeah, no, yeah, I, look, I, they're definitely, they're definitely off. Like, I mean, I don't know how obvious it was on TV, but off, like live there, some of their efforts on kick chase, some of their um, work to get off the ground quickly from having made a tackle, 
They were way off. They're back to where they were, you know, pre pre Sean Edwards, you know, pre Galtier, where they just looked like they weren't overly interested. Obviously, they can spring to life with ball in hand, and they don't look <laughs> don't look tired then. Mm. But it's the stuff they do off the ball, um, which I think has dropped off a little bit. And you know, the game in Ireland is obviously you know forty six minute ball in play, and you say, well, look, they're not used to playing that the top fourteen. They picked a massive pack. That's exactly what they don't want. But the game against Scotland wasn't... It was fast at times, but it wasn't as fast. And they still looked um, a little bit off. So speaking to some of their uh, reporters over there um, and, and the feedback, they look, because it's... The relationship between the reporters and the journalists and the players over there is completely different in Ireland. I mean, you know, most of those reporters, the journalists of France, would have the players' mobile numbers and be able to ring them all the time. Whereas... I know you have a lot of numbers, not, not uh, Neil, but... Yeah, uh, I really, uh, Jesus, are you saying I'm not in constant <laughs> communication with Johnny Zexon? No, but it's managed very differently here, as you know, and, and maybe the public don't know, like you you literally only get them when you're giving them. Um, and uh, so the, the feedback that they're getting from the players and the club coaches and, and some of the national coaches as well is, look at, um, you know, we... A lot of our players are running on on, on fumes. Um, the Ponte, for example, has played eighteen games. Other guys like Willem says just come back from injury and he's gone straight into Test rugby. Um, Audrey isn't at the level that he has been at. Um, you know, we're missing Dante. You know, we're missing John Baptiste Crow, who who shares the workload with Cyril Boss and Mo Vaca, who shares the workload with Marshan. So every team has injuries, but France probably have. You know, three, three or four players that are absolutely crucial for them, um, and they just believe, and I would believe as well that you know, get this top fourteen finished, and they go into their five weeks holiday, then they go into French camp exclusively till till the World Cup. So any doubt about their fatigue, either mental or physical, will be uh, blown out of water. And I don't think they, I think they can handle the pressure. I, I don't think that's that's too much for them because in France and in France culture and France sport, you know. The pressure you're on to play at home all the time is is massive anyway. So a home World Cup isn't you know isn't going to take um, much more out of them. They're used to that. Um, so no, I think they'll be back. They'll be back, and they're fine tuning their game a little bit. And they're finding little areas that aren't working, which from a Galtier point of view is actually good for them because I believe in their coaching staff. I believe they have the smarts to to learn from you know um, the little the little areas they're being exploited in. Mm-hmm. Um. We're we've plenty to get through here, so I'm I'm, I'm where is skipping things over. We'll probably talk a little bit more about England and Wales next week, but just one point I want to make on on England, Mick, and it's you know we've seen Marcus Smith released back to to Harlequins for this down week now to get a bit of game time. It looks like George Ford is probably going to be coming into the squad next week, and I I know it's a very divisive kind of selection going for an own Farrell or George Ford type ahead of Marcus Smith with with England, but is it? Is it important at least for Stewart or Steve Borthwick that he's he's making a clear decision on it rather than being kind of caught in a halfway house? I know it's it's not something a lot of people agree with. They see Marcus Smith as a you know this brilliant brilliant rugby player who can unlock defenses, but at the very least, is Borthwick doing the right thing by kind of nailing his colours to a mast here? Definitely, I think he I think he needs to draw a line in the sand. Um. I think they've experimented enough with um, Marcus Smith at 10 and, and Farrell at 12. Um, and, you know, historically, England, they've always gone better, in my opinion, when they have, like, when they have a crash ball 12 and then they have a kind of ball playing 13. Um, in terms of Marcus Smith going back to play for Harlequins, I'd imagine Steve Borthwick is kind of looking at how Marcus Smith has played in the past, when he's played his best stuff, why he's played his best stuff. And he's done that because he's been playing kind of 80 minutes week in, week out. Um, So, you know, from a conversation point of view, I'd say Steve Borts was kind of saying to Mark Smith, I want to be fair to you here. I want you to kind of be at your best. And when I've seen you at your best, you've been playing, you've been playing a lot of 80 minute games. Um, And in my mind, that would be, that would be the reasoning for, for sending them back to Harlequins. Yeah, be interesting to see how that goes anyway this weekend and into next week where, as I say, we'll talk a little bit more about, about England and Wales. Birch, on URC this weekend, so we've got four games this uh, this weekend, starting off at Munster and Scarlet's on Friday. Edinburgh 
against Leinster on Saturday. Dragons and Connacht, Cardiff against Ulster. I'm going to start off all of this, though, by mentioning Ulster beating the Sharks last Saturday because that result has blown the playoff race fairly wide open. Um, If you look at it, it was there were probably about three or four other teams, fans, who were who were celebrating an Ulster win against the Sharks down in South Africa, as well as the Ulster fans were. But that was a massive, massive result for Ulster. That was huge. And I think, to be honest, I certainly probably felt when that game was refixed and looked at the timing of it, um, that it was going to be a, a loss for, for Ulster. Just, um, I thought they'd be losing a few players for international. Um, Judy, Sharks would be full strength. I, I hadn't realised the Sharks were going to have a Springbok training camp, which obviously made it a little bit easier. But it was still a massive result and and, and puts Ulster up to third, gives them a little bit of breathing space. Glasgow losing, a, very, a, a second string Glasgow losing, losing to the Lions, you know, opened up a little bit of breathing room for Ulster. Um, and it was a huge win. I mean, you know, they were disappointed with how they, with the previous week, when they, or previous round when they lost to, to Glasgow away and didn't really play well. But that will give Dan McFarland's team, you know, a real shot in the arm and, um, they can look forward now to uh, a really exciting run in and, and um, hopefully find their, their best form. But just for that squad of players to go down there and do that, I think that's going to give them so much confidence. Yeah, it, it looks like it really will. And Mick, how much, um, I'm curious, to know, how much would you have seen last season of, of young Harry Sheridan? Because he's, he got his chance there a few months ago and he's been in and out of the team and making some, some really good impacts. And that try he scored on Saturday where, for a player of his age to be carrying pretty much three or four of the Sharks players over the try line from a standing start roughly five metres out, it was a an absolutely remarkable try and it ultimately it proved to be the decisive one. No, I would have seen Harry a lot last season. Um, you know, he, he trained with us, trained with us every day. Um, <laughs> and the best way to describe him is that he's just, he's raw. You know, he's just, he's hard and he's raw and he's the kind of guy that you kind of want to try and avoid the training at all costs because, you know, there's a, there's a touch of the dev turners about him in terms of him kind of clashing knees with you or like kind of accidentally poking you in the eye or whatever. Um, But, you know, the, everyone always knew that uh when he did get his crack, he, he was going to go well. He's just one of these really hardy young lads. And then on top of that, he's he's got a very good, very good rugby brain as well. Um, as you mentioned, seeing him kind of carry four Sharks lads over the line with them. Um, I know maybe people outside of the Ulster environment would be surprised to see that, but it wouldn't come as a massive surprise to the guys who are kind of training with him day in, day out. But he's been a real positive in what's been a, a difficult couple of months for Ulster. Yeah, he has. And I, I was speaking to Jack McGrath yesterday, who obviously would have like make, played with him, and he said um, he's a quality operator and he just needed to get a chance. And... Um, it's it's sometimes just like we always look to the older players to to kind of steer us out of um steer teams out of a little tricky spot but you know when you get a youngster who's just putting his hand up and leading from the front um like he is that's a that's a massive bonus and uh no he looks he looks like he's quality look i think Ulster should be a top four team um uh and they obviously had a really difficult period um away to sail etc but no, I just you know I I'd love to see them now use that Sharks game as, as the the opportunity just to reset and and go and and you know show the type of form they're capable of towards the end of the season. Yeah, so Ulster away to Cardiff this Saturday evening, seven thirty five. the The first game of the URC week is Friday night down at Musgrave Park, and Bert, I have to say I'm I'm really looking forward to going down there in the hopes of potentially seeing the RG Snyman come back. He's back in full training for the last couple of weeks. Munster say he's available for selection. We'll find out tomorrow afternoon if he's in the squad. But look, whether he makes the return this week against the Scarlets or in a couple of weeks' time against uh, against the Glasgow Warriors at Thoman Park, it's it's fantastic to just see him back out there after what he's been through over, over the last two and a half years, not even over the last 17 months. Yeah, it's been cruel for him. Um, and what a boost that would be for for Munster. I mean, they've been looking, you know, really sharp lately. Obviously, the Ospreys didn't didn't fire, but the way Munster went after them from the first minute, um, the 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 relationship between Fekatawa and and Frisch, you know, is uh, looks like it's it's electric, and that could be 
so exciting to watch, you know, over over the end of the season. But if they get R- RG Snyman back and he can just stay fit, you know, um, he's one of the best locks in the world. So um, fingers crossed for him now. It can't have been easy, um, uh, but it's great to see him being back available for selection. And whether it's this week or, um, or, or in the coming weeks, I just think, you know, um, he's going to add so much to Munster. Mick, what's it like as a as a player when you you see one of your one of your teammates who's been properly through the ringer for for a long period with bad injuries finally getting a chance to to make a comeback? Ah, it's brilliant, and you know it gives. I think it gives the whole squad a lot of energy. You know, seeing someone like that come through a really tough time, uh, and hopefully come out the other side and and start performing well. Uh, you know it. It puts a really good vibe into the team. Um, and, you know, when he does get on the pitch and he does start playing again, like the positive uh, is that, you know, there's no doubt he's going to he's gonna have a, a serious impact on how Munster are playing. Um, I'm rattling through topics here because we are run, running out of time. But the news from Leinster this week, Birch, new contract for Leo Cullen. Good time down for, for two years. Because he, in the last couple of years he's just been doing twelve month extensions, but given there's you know there's coaching changes coming over the summer as well with Stuart Lancaster leaving, and there you know there's a bit of a rejig happening. They've had a new CEO come in in the last few months as well. Probably just is good for their point of view to to get an extra year of of security, an extra year of assuredness out of it all. They must have put an extra zero on it to get Leo to, <laughs> to sign for another year. So uh, I think he's smiling all the way to the bank manager in Sandy Mount. Um, no, it's great. It's, it gives look at when you have a bit of change, and Leinster don't have a lot of change um, very often, which is part of the success. Um, but great job with the new CEO to just time down for two years, let him remodel his coaching staff, um, and just continue what they're doing because I know they they're disappointed with the amount of trophies they have, European trophies since 2018. But uh, week in week out, they're probably they are one of the most they are the most consistent team in Europe, I think, and. Um, you have to believe that trophy, trophies will come. Yeah. He's done a reasonable enough job, Mick, hasn't he? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's done a good job. He's done a good job. It's going to be interesting to see how this season finishes out now um, with, you know, if, if Leinster can can win their next game against Ulster, every other game is going to be in the Aviva for them in the run-in. So uh, if ever there was a year to to do the double, I suppose, um this is it. And I know all those lads be keen to give Stuart a really good send off as well. So uh, it's going to be fascinating to watch. Final point. Uh, I mentioned Connacht as well, because they're away to the Dragons on Saturday evening. That game's live on RT2 and RT player as well. But look, like we're into the final four games of the of the URC regular season. Connacht, as things stand of the table here in front of me, they're in eighth place, 35 points. They're one ahead of Cardiff, who are one back from them. They're five off the, the Sharks, who are up in up in seventh. The two questions for for Connacht Birch is ultimately can they stay in the top eight, and bear in mind as well they have played all of their inter pros. Their South Africa trip is behind them, so on paper at least the the fixtures list is relatively kind. So can they stay in the top eight? But also crucially, can they potentially jump up to seventh, which they would probably need to do to secure a Champions Cup spot? Because at the moment, you know Cardiff are the the highest ranked Welsh team in ninth. They would they would be taking one of the the Champions Cup places. So for Connacht, it's a kind of a twofold rest of the season. First of all, it's staying in the playoffs, and then it's also trying to hop another spot, which would secure a Champions Cup place. Yeah, look, it's great to see them in eight. Um, given the I suppose the uh, the nature, the hard nature of their early season fixtures and what they have in front of them, and and this is this is the game. This is the game that will will decide. It's a tricky enough. Um, game on paper. Dragons have got players released back from Welsh squad: Wayne Wright, Leon Brown, uh, Dragons Bradley Rock. last year as well. Yeah, exactly. Um, now Dragons' form isn't isn't good, but it's just a tip. It's just a game that Connacht need to show um, that they they can build some consistency. And obviously, you know, they're coming off the back of some some nice wins. Um, but to go away from home and win this, if they, if they win this, then you'd have to say, looking at their other fixtures, um, they have a cracking chance of being top eight, and and obviously. You know, trying to get the seventh. I think trying to get the seventh will be will be difficult. But mm-hmm. um, they they really need to, to make sure that I suppose um, they put their best foot forward. You know, they'll obviously have a couple of Prendergast is back from from Ireland squad. He'll play. 
uh, their attack has been going well. And in fairness, if they attack well against Dragons, they'll they'll win because the Dragons have been shipping a lot of points um, uh, again this season. So I, I can't wait to see this game. I think it's it's a huge one for Connacht in terms of being a top eight side this year. It is, and and Mick, if Andy if Andy Friend can sign off his his time at Connacht by getting them into the top eight, whether or not that's enough for a Champions Cup spot remains to be seen. But consider look, considering the the start of the season they had, where they were away from home for their first three or four games in South Africa as well, right off the bat, it would be it would be a pretty pretty good season, all things considered. No, definitely. Um, as you mentioned, I think the first five games Connacht had was was the toughest start I've seen any team have in a long time in the league. Um, I'd imagine they'll be hoping that a couple of teams around them do them favours. Like they'll be hoping that obviously Ulster beat Cardiff this weekend. Um, like the Sharks run in isn't easy at all. Um, they have the Stormers now this weekend. Then they have to go to the Scarlets who, who are on a bit of a run in terms of kind of having won their last five or six games. Then Munster in Europe, I think they might have a Benetton game in there after that. And then they have to play Munster again. Um, so, you know, I think if Connacht can just can keep putting performances together, as you lads have mentioned, this week is is almost like a final for them in terms of uh, what they need to do. Um, but hopefully, hopefully teams around them do them a bit of a favour and they can manage to stay in the top seven or top eight. And, and Andy Frank can get a good sign off for himself. Yeah, decent final few games in store for us anyway over the over the next couple of months. So that is uh that is Dragons against Connacht 735 on Saturday evening live on RT2 and RT player RT also showing Munster and Scarlets on Friday night from Musgrave Park. That game kicking off at 735 as well. Lads, there was loads more we could have spoken about, but we're completely out of time, unfortunately. Uh for all your news, get to rt.e forward slash sports. You can get uh, all the latest news on on whatever's happening in the world of rugby uh, over the next week or so. And we'll be back again next week on the RT Rugby Podcast. Fellas, thanks a million.